Hello, everyone. We are um, super happy to have uh, with us today Eva Fanes. You correct me if I uh, misspell. Uh, huh? It's more or less. Huh? Um, um, so uh, she will be our last uh, lecturer uh, on our series, so the ninth uh, lecture. Um, it's actually the only one uh, out of the nine people that I don't know personally. Uh, um, the reason uh, we asked her to come um, is that uh, we are, let's say, extremely intrigued and uh, fascinated uh, by the work of the office, uh, Ouz Architect um, from the Netherlands, that works also in the Netherlands, but also in a lot of different places, uh, which is quite, uh, let's say, exceptional for such a small office, because uh, normally, let's say, we always have the idea that um, the offices that go international are like OMA or SOM or like these generic uh, gigantic uh, offices. So to see a small office like who's working everywhere um, in the US, in the UK, in France, uh, I think Belgium, Germany, um, plenty of places uh, is extremely encouraging and interesting because it shows also a way of uh, being able to be specific um, not necessarily in the place that you work. Uh, uh, so you go to different places and you develop uh, ways to be specific. At least that's the impression uh, we get uh, from outside. Um, another reason uh, that we thought it would be great to, to hear Eva today was that, um, let's say they deal uh, with a lot of diff different issues on different scales, uh, the environment, water, urgencies, social aspects, etc., but always through design. This as well is an interpretation. Huh? Uh, and we know that there are, let's say, a lot of offices dealing with urgencies, but for which the question of design is maybe uh, secondary. And what we find fascinating in whose work is this, this way of really articulating that and making it into a kind of tool for design. Uh, and to be able to work on really different scale from the urban to the architectural and always, in, uh, let's say, including these uh, much larger uh, questions and uh, urgencies. Um, so thank you very much, Eva. Um, voilà. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the introduction, Ida. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm quite excited uh, to present our work to you today. And um, yeah, I guess I, I prepare, prepared some works that are very small scale and some works that deal with the larger urban issues. So I hope you don't get bored and uh, <laughs> then I will, I, will, I will start to share the screen, right? And then we hopefully have some time to talk afterwards. So please, if you have some questions coming up, uh, note them down for after the lecture. I'm happy to go into a conversation. And I didn't mention, but of course, you can either um, ask questions yourselves at the end of the lecture or just send them uh, via chat uh, to me or Jacques uh, at the end, and then we'll just read them out loud. Thank you. Could you enable me to share the screen, please? OK. Ah, yes. Okay, let's start. So my lecture is called today Building Capacity and I'm going to explain um, in the introduction a little bit what we mean by building capacity, which you can read two ways, really uh, with an emphasis on the, on the building or with an emphasis on, on the capacity. This is Earth, our planet that we inhabit together with other species. It's a closed system that means that only energy can enter or come out. More and more frequently, we ask ourselves the same question that already Henri David Thoreau asked himself in 1860. What is the use of a house if you haven't got a tolerable planet to put it on? Our planet is heating, um, is heating up. It is on a pathway to a multiple burnout. 
socially as well as environmentally as well as climatically, one is in fact linked to the other. Linear extraction processes that are feeding human needs are linking ever-growing urban systems to their hinterlands, which can even be on the other side of the planet. These processes largely invisible to the inhabitants of the cities normally. The role of nature, even though it plays an essential role in producing all these in principle renewable resources, has become largely decorative and more and more separated from urban communities. Currently, we are living at 1.7 Earth's capacity. As we do live on only one planet, however, this creates a depth for future generations. Pollution, CO2 emissions, even prevent energy in the form of heat to escape the planet into space as it would normally do. Fires are one of the obvious consequences. This behavior leads to a growing risk and uncertainty. The uncertainty, it varies um, in the most optimistically, it's about 1.7 degrees. Uh, less optimistically, it's up to three or even four degrees. So that's the current worst case scenarios with all the consequences for cities that we can only hint at with this visualization. However, um, planetary capacity is not static. We can deplete it, but we can also actively build it up by going back to and rewiring natural dynamics. And cities can play an active role in this. So this is what our work at OOS uh, tries to respond to exactly this urgency, to the question, how can these infrastructural and natural flows, economic streams, cultural and community processes be systematically integrated into their local and wider and historic urban contexts. Smaller cycles are more reactive and can help to deal more easily with uncertainty, hence creating local resiliency. The operating manual for planet Earth. As we all know, in fact, there is no operating manual. If at all, it could only be built incrementally with other disciplines and the younger generation. So to illustrate uh, these conceptual ideas, um, let's go a little bit into the flows. So the ocean uh, is, is water, pure water. It seems in, infinite, in fact. But contrary to what it is perceived, water is finite. Water is a material, a resource. You see here roughly the volume that we have available. And the water that we can drink um, is extremely small. It is this, uh, this small piece, two small bowls here. And the groundwater is not even readily available. So in fact, it is only this water, this amount next to our planet. But water is also a flow next to being a material. It's a resource that can be endlessly recycled in the same quality without downcycling. Um, urban design is a, is, a, is a process that contributes to the evolution of the urban space over time. And I will now share um, a series of projects that address how we can make big changes step by step by starting small and so contribute to a build urban resiliency, adaptation and mitigation capacity. I will show how over time this can help to inform larger urban processes. Our on-site prototypes try to manifest natural cycles spatially and transform them into physical experiences for users. They open spaces for imagination that create a shared memory. And afterwards, I will show uh, three or two or three, depends on the time, uh, large-scale urban spatial strategies um, in the Global South and the last one in Rotterdam for the Rotterdam um, Architecture Biennial Down to Earth. So let's start with Germany, uh, with a dirty river in Germany, the Emscher Kunst uh, between the waters. This is a post-industrial landscape um, with coal extraction, cl a clean and a dirty river. So this is the dirty river, this is the clean river. And the dirty one is actually the most polluted river in Germany. Because of coal extraction, everything had to be put overground 
and now everything has sunken. There was around nine cube kilometer of coal that were extracted. So you see all the land has sunken. Only this original river is at the height and everything needs to be pumped into that river. Between the waters is a water supply infrastructure line between those two rivers. It's a complete and sustainable water supply system. It only uses water from the immediate area, the river water and the wastewater. The main element of the water supply and treatment installation are two toilets, which you see here, those two yellow toilets. A halophyte filter to clean and treat this water. So this is this area here, it's around 60 square meter. Uh, a community garden, um, a drinking water station and a rainwater collecting roof. Um, this system is fed with some um, uh, solar cells that are here mounted on the roof and it only works uh, with water and electricity that is available on the site. By putting the treatment process on display, it shows that it is possible to reclaim and restore the natural habitat by using low-tech processes to construct a high-tech system. Users become part of the water cycle by drinking beer that was brewed on location. And it's also a set, set a sort of act of placemaking. The setup leads to a change in perspective that challenges the current status quo. The next project, project is of soil and water, the King's Cross Pond Club. Um, that was also a temporary project during almost two years, part of the Relay Art Program in central London. Um, you see here the, at the time it was the Europe's biggest redevelopment project um, in central London. So you see here um, St. Pancras, you see here King's Cross Station and in the back this building here is now Central St. Martin's University and in between you have the Regents Canal. The project was occupying a temporary site in the midst of this large construction site in London. It created a micro-ecological environment with a natural swimming pond at its center. The pond is entirely free of chemicals. The water is purified by natural processes using plants, nutrient mineralization, and a set of filters to supplement natural filtration. Once cleaned, the water loops back into the pond to complete the water cycle. You also see here that the entire process again is visible and becomes comprehensible for visitors to the site. Uh, so they also understand that the daily number of bathers is restricted to 163 by the amount of water that the system is able to clean. So there's sort of um, idea of capacity. So to come back to building capacity. So we learn how to build capacity over time. The joy of swimming combines with an awareness of our responsibility towards the environment. There was also a wonderful community petition um, where, where people, the a very broad team of swimmers, wild swimmers, um, actors, um, TV doctors, mediators. So you see here really this very broad uh, team that managed to get 5,000 signatures on the way to keep the pond because the pond appeared as a public project, but it was actually sponsored and developed on private land by the developer, um, King's Cross Limited. Um, and what was interesting that in this petition, love and place were the two most frequently used words um, that people used to express. Um, so it became also an enclave of biodiversity and the wildlife that comes with it in the midst of a very groomed urban setting. So the project becomes a tool to change culture and to change how we look at nature and how we interact with it. The next project is the Public Space Society, a project for art and the city. Uh, with Christoph Doswald as a curator. Um, what I also need to mention is that for all these um, installations that we realize in the framework of large art installations or biennials, we work together with the artist, the Slovenian artist Majetica Potvic, um, already since 10 years with more or less one or two 
of those um, projects uh, per year. So this was located on the Stadionbrache in Zürich uh, next to the housing cooperative Kraftwerk One, um, which, is which is actually one of the first housing cooperatives that is completely self-run as a commons project. Um, the public space society is an experiment that searches how, to how a shared public space could be organized and managed by residents on a neighborhood level. And um, perhaps you know, but in Switzerland, they have a device which is called the Baugespann. And the Baugespann is like a structure which marks out the corners and the height of a new building. And uh, so this is really a democratic tool so that people can interact and, and actually um, yeah, negotiate this newly to be built um, space that is taken. So here we were inspired by the knowledge and um, the self-organizational experience of the Swiss Genossenschaft. So that was the, the other inspiration and together that became the public space society. So we used this tool to actually mark out a new public space and then hold some meetings in this space to discuss what is commons in Swiss, that is called Almende, and how that could be managed. So we ran a series of, um, of these um, urban discussions and urban meetings, which always went hand in hand with a great hospitality by the people of the Stadionbrache and home cooked food and bread. And um, what, what we learned from the experience is that a place like the Stadionbrach is very precious and it doesn't, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's the re result of a very big negotiation that took place with the officials from the city that of course feared, I mean, even crazy things like prostitution would happen if they would give up uh, this space. And the Stadionbrache, uh, contrary to what you might believe, has actually very strict rules um, to which everybody who is using it must adhere. So new projects always are agreed um, in a common way with very um, specific meetings. But what they also told us is that the temporariness um, is, very, is a very important factor and it allows you to try out things which are much more light and much more um, fast and experimental than a very long-term project. The other thing that came out is that people start to engage with a space if they get also the freedom to do so. So, and with freedom comes responsibility. So in the Stadionbrache, actually everybody is responsible. So if you propose something, you actually have to do it. And so this is a way of looking at public space that is sort of uh, challenging. Um, what role, is it even clear what role we can play in the public space? So the last of these um, projects, of the small projects that I'm going to show, was the, is the wind lift. Uh, that was again a temporary installation um, in Folkestone next to an old viaduct over which the train runs. And um, we looked at the question, how can we uh, harvest a local resource, in this case wind, and what can we do with this resource to, to make it sort of into a physical thing? So here uh, you see a site lift uh, that's normally on building sites combined with a very modern windmill. So the side lift goes up if the wind lift has generated enough energy. You see here a display that keep a dashboard that is actually keeping this capacity, uh, making it visible. And then what you see from the top is, is the sea. Um, it's actually this, this outlook into, into, the, into the far future that you normally uh, only get from, from the train. And what it also did, it actually, as you can see here, it created, it's again an act of placemaking. Uh, people became very proud um, that there's another way to look at this very old viaduct and neighbors actually started to serve tea to the visitors. Um, ah yeah, so I forgot there's one more, <laughs> that is the Future Island. 
Um, this is not yet built, but it is our first permanent project. Um, it will be built on the Albano campus that's currently in production, in construction in north of Stockholm. We got invited by the Swedish Art Council. And this is also a project that will be exhibited next year in the Venice Biennial. Um, when we got invited, we were really fascinated by the amount of granite that is actually under the site and that is all taken out of the site. And uh, together with this sort of outlook of 100 years, the project needs to last 100 years, we came up with the formation of a new island for the park of the campus. So this is the future island, which is a, a new island of rocks where uh, a small stream that will run across the park will be separated in two. And it will consist of rocks that are found on the site and half of the island will be heated to plus five degrees. Um, with some devices like heat exchange pumps and solar panels. Um, and this is to, to, make, to sort of um, kind of research what will happen to for flora and fauna um, under this uh, changing conditions. And so this is as it heats up, and as you might know, the north um, hemisphere is actually heating up faster. The more north we go, the, the more discrepancy is with current temperatures. Um, so here you see a technical drawing of how this will work out, that half of the island will be, will be heated uh, by devices. We also link to a group of scientists that will um, that will monitor the site together with uh, the Science House, which is a special um, institute for children to learn science. So here you see the prototype with some holes inserted, which where the stone will be heated. And this prototype is the one that will actually travel by train to Venice to become then part of the Giardini Pavilion and heat up the space um, there. So, now I will show the urban, um, some of the urban projects. Um, this is Agua Carioca and Agua Paulista, a circular urban system that was entirely self-initiated and where, where we collaborated with various local parties, such as Studio X um, from Columbia University and the CTO Roberto Bole Marx. We started with, a, with, a, with an intense research um, where we interviewed people from the various uh, neighborhoods and backgrounds through a growing network that we started to build. Um, and we started to interview them based on our many previous projects that we had done in Europe. What is their relationship with water and what are their problems um, in the favelas with water and how water is actually part of the culture, but how it's also very political and in that case very contested and perhaps why in favelas um, there is um, always such a huge problem with water and sewage. You see here the, the Tishuka rainforest, one of the largest urban forests in the world. And in the back you see uh, Rio de Janeiro with uh, Ipanema Beach, uh, one of the most known postcard images. And so this is inside the forest where we have the Dream. The, the Rio Carioca is, is, is coming out here and it's, it's really wonderful and extremely clean. You can drink this water. And five kilometers later, um, the same stream looks like this, uh, which is also called the lingua negra, so the black tongue. So something happens in between and the something in between is actually the city. Um, how this water is treated so-called is what we see here that is an emissario submarino which is a large pipe that goes out some kilometers out into the sea um, so in fact this is just a, a primary treatment it's not really a treatment um, also when it's not treated you see here the rivers coming out this is around 20,000 liters of human waste per second that goes into the bay and normally this is treated with uh, in, in large sewage treatment stations that are outside the city 
um, that are totally isolated. Nobody wants to live with it or even next to it. Uh, there is a nuisance of smell. And so we, we understand these systems a little bit like living outside the body. Like if we have, uh, if we speak about the urban metabolism and the, the city as a body, we have all these kind of waste collection points, uh, we, the, the treatment systems, um, our power stations, everything is actually around rather than inside the body. That would be so much more efficient because a lot of um, energy that goes into transport simply is, um, is avoided. But also we start to have another relationship rather than seeing it as waste, we see it becoming a part of a system. So the traditional way we develop cities um, is, is very isolated and depending on this relationship with the, with the hinterland, which is like a um, contained city. So the question is, can we go more towards an isotropic city, which is more fractal? Um, it's, it's, it's sort of expandable. Um, it doesn't have this inside-outside relationship, but it rather incorporates nature and solves problems directly, locally, where they occur. So this is what we started to look at. Uh, we started to look at this analogy from the body, from the human body that is uh, largely made up of water, how our lungs and how our kidneys function and how our blood is um, treated by, by being oxygenized. And how the same thing actually happens, uh, which you saw already in the Emscher Kunst project or in the swimming pond, in, in these halophyte filters, in these systems that actually uh, oxygenize, so it's specific plants that oxy oxygenize the ground. And so through this oxygenation process, all these uh, little bacteria um, get actually eaten up and become part of a food chain. And so we can use this process to incorporate the house uh, with a septic tank, a constructed wetland into the whole water cycle. And we can, we can save around 50% of the water. And then we looked how we could upscale the system into different neighborhoods and link it to, um, to the Guanabara Bay. So we actually devised a project where we said we have different locations or different favelas, different slums. You have here the Guanabara Bay of Rio de Janeiro uh, with the zona south. The zona sul is, is around here. So here you have the Copacabana Beach, for instance, and Rio Centro is here. So we worked um, with, a, with two favelas in the flatlands. One is here, uh, a school. And one is here, the Rio das Pedras favela, and two, which are on the mountains, very close to where the water is still clean, which is the Mojo da Formiga and Mojo do Salguero. Um, for each of those locations, we worked um, with engineer, with an engineer, we, we worked with locals, and we, we looked at what is the capacity of this specific location to collect water, treat it locally, communicate about this new system. And in the school in Marais, we chose a school, the SIEP, that's a school where we have like 500 of those built by Oscar Niemeyer. Um, and we looked at how we can connect the toilets, collect that water, make a septic tank that is very attractive, a bit like a, some sort of continent, a link it to a halophyte filter, have a pavilion, that we can actually run workshops, but that's also collecting the water like a storage and then have a pipeline that uh, goes around a football field and with this water actually irrigate a school garden. The next project is on a slope. That's the next scale up. That's a, it's, it's a, like a community um, of a couple of hundred people, 750 inhabitants where we look at how we can insert those kidneys, if you want, into the spaces that are left over in between, that are currently sloped, uh, that are currently taken by a lot of waste and are very degraded rather than being an active uh, and positive part of the urban environment. So we look here how to insert these kidneys, how to combine it with a freshwater system coming from the mountain, and how to clean this water directly, so collect it in septic tanks, filter it through those kidneys, 
so that we can also run a community garden with a public space here within the favela and we avoid actually running an open sewage that is normally the case. So in the next uh, scale up, uh, Moda Formiga, we look at around 3000 inhabitants and you see here very beautifully this analogy with, with the lung in fact. Uh, where the pollution is not ending up somewhere outside, but it's treated directly. And Moda Famiga is amazing because it has a stream, a uh, quite strong stream with a, with a waterfall at the end, where the older generation still remembers the times before the 70s, before actually the whole culture of, of soft drinks and, and with the soft drinks came, comes sort of plastic packaging that doesn't degrade anymore and that then this sort of um, solid waste lent, let also led to a degradation of the space. So all this goes hand in hand and people are still here to remember how it was before. So then we looked at how an investment that comes into infrastructure, so normally we as architects, we work with investments that come into the cultural realm, but also in infrastructure, there's actually large, much larger budgets typically available to solve all these issues and these budgets typically go underground. Um, so that is where the design factor is interesting to point out where we actually take these items, we actually design with them, we place them over ground and we make them into arrangements that generate civic space and that become larger than only uh, dealing with water, rainwater collection and wastewater, but that also include then garbage, solar energy, food and public space making. Um, then, of course, uh, you wonder how is this all run and how does the process work? Um, so here in our urban projects, we always uh, make visualizations of this process as it is so important, where we look at stage one, which is the project initiation. Um, where, where we, we use tools like an exhibition, for instance, or like a film uh, to start to communicate what are the possibilities. The next step is then a collaborative uh, design meetings where, of course, the designer also has the role to make, um, to make visual and to, to, to enable people to see how their reality could change. And then comes the collective effort of building and last but not least, the management and multiplication process across the neighborhood. Um, we also made then some uh, visualizations to see how this space would actually not lead to a gentrification process, but how actually the self-built um, 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 capacity and, and power of such a neighborhood could lead to actually self-built infrastructural projects uh, that would then scale up through the neighborhood and would lead to a change in, in behavior, would lead to a change in the services that uh, Favela is connected to, uh, would lead to a change in how uh, the urban space can be used and how proud people can actually feel about the space where they live. The next step was to build a pilot and the pilot was not yet in uh, this very contested and tricky urban setting, but it was in the Sitio Roberto Bole Marx, which is uh, the location where Roberto Bole Marx, one of the most important landscape architects in Brazil, he actually bought this piece of land, he turned it into a botanical garden and he was, uh, already researching how to make it as biodiverse uh, as possible. So we worked here with, um, with people who still remember Roberto Borle Marx, uh, how to make a sort of tropicalization of this system and how to build these different elements. So what you see here is also um, that we really itemize, so like a sort of metabolic system, you see here a toilet, you see here a septic, tank, the red thing in the front, you see here the halophyte, the, the plant filter, and the water storage that collects rainwater, but also the reused water. 
and how we then use this system as a, like a live classroom. So this is together with Peter Rivera from Studio X, uh, part of the exhibition that we had was to visit this and to communicate how it functions to children, to students, to uh, authorities from the municipality to the government. And so this was the exhibition with the drawings you saw before uh, printed on large panels of wood and a model of each of, of, the, of the case studies, in fact. Um, that we continued then uh, in Sao Paulo as part of the Sao Paulo Biennial and we make a proper report uh, to monitor the process of each of those um, case studies. So the next, I have to check where we are time-wise. Um, so the next project is a City of Thousand Tanks, um, which was for us a real step forward because rather than being self-driven and self-initiated and actually looking for money all the time to realize these works, we, we, won a, we were one of the two teams for the City of Chennai that uh, won the tender for the Water as Leverage for Resilient Cities Asia program of the Dutch government. Um, the, this program was um, run in three cities in the Asian region, in Kulna, in Bangladesh, in Samarang, in Indonesia, and in Chennai, in South India. Um, seeing, you know, the Dutch, the Dutch people are, have a sort of intrinsic relationship with water. Obviously, most of the country is under the water level, which is very precarious. Um, and so as because of rising sea levels and in, in Asia, there's many mega cities that become very um, precarious. So to look at water, how can water be a leverage for a more inclusive urban development together with the SDGs, the Sustainable Urban Development Goals? That was the ambition of this project and how to bring this into action. So we started, uh, like half of the people you see here are part of our team, um, which is partly Dutch, uh, partly uh, for a large part local. So we worked also with, uh, with environmentalists, with architects, with engineers from the Madras, um, um, from the IIT Madras, the university, technical university in Chennai but also with many authorities to get into the sort of Indian bureaucracy uh, to see how we can realize. So you see have here India, you have all the watersheds of India. And so, so you see mostly they drain towards the Bay of Bengal. As they, as they run over this large country, they heat up um, and they come down in, in large rains, which is monsoons, which, ha which happen in two months of the year only. So what you get is this scenario here, like floating in floods um, in, the, in the winter when it's monsoon time during two months and fighting for drops in summer when it gets completely dry. Next to this, the third problem is the intense pollution uh, that happens that is obviously always blamed on the inhabitants of the slums, which are totally not the cause. So what you see here is also illegal dumping uh, in sites. And um, what we learned was that um, originally there was a brilliant, ingenious system of dealing with this problem of too much water, uh, in winter and uh, too much water in summer and not enough um, uh, in the other part. So that was a sort of system of lakes that uh, were all over the countryside, but also within the city. And then what happened in the sort of intense urbanization process is that all these lakes got encroached. Uh, two thirds of the city is sealed. And obviously in those areas, they are very prevalent for floods, but these floods are not uh, climate change related, they are in fact man-made. Another ingenious system um, to, to deal with this is the historic tanks, the temple tanks. So each temple, each religious institution has a temple tank. And now those tanks, they have a big capacity to store water, but they are mostly empty. Um, next to this urban changes that we see, 
the context and the climate change projections uh, for the next 100 years don't look good at all. We look at around a 1 to 3 percent rise in temperature, uh, a decrease in rainfall, but an increase in intensity in rainfall and additionally a sea level rise, which can lead to saltification of the ground. Currently, emissions from water sourcing, because uh, when there's a drought, water, water has to be brought into the city by tanks. So the emissions are intense. At the same time, also the emissions from exposed sewage are intense uh, with uh, methane emitting from there. And the default response, it's a little bit like in Rio, but still even stronger because there's less water available is the stormwater drains and the desalination plants. So this is ironic because the stormwater drains bring out the water as fast as possible outside into the sea where it's sort of lost forever and then it can only come back by desalination processes. So a little bit like the diagram I showed you before with the body that has all the organs outside, we see here this linear process going through the organism of the city and the aim is to include these processes in the city and so now we also work in section because we use the ground of Chennai that is very suitable for recharge to include it in this circular development. We look at a model um, where we can go from scarcity which is the case right now to abundance in the future so rather than externalizing, so bringing the water in from lakes, from desalination up to 200 kilometers outside the city and actually polluting the already diminished aquifer and polluting the sea and letting all this wastewater uh, go out into the sea, we're looking at shrinking the cycle. So as you can see, this already looks a lot smaller because the water is recycled. We use only 50% and we keep the aquifer clean and stable. The tools we have available is tools we find in nature, so-called nature-based solutions, uh, which is more and more a theme that's coming up. How can nature-based solutions help us to deal with our problems which we have in the city? The, 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 the most important ones is of course forests and natural wetland reserves um, that are ideal but also then uh, when we go more inside the city, we have green roofs, uh, water we can collect on the roof, um, what we saw, the, the constructed wetlands with septic tanks. We can use in principle all the spaces we have, uh, the, the streets as well as squares to collect water, to treat it and to make temporary tanks, for instance, that only function squares, that only function as tanks for two, two months uh, per year and renaturalize as well. So we work with plants, we find solutions in plants, we find solutions in the soil. So here you see this uh, impenetrable clay layer and below the two uh, like mixed and then the sand layer. So with the recharge wells, which are placed um, in the ground, we go through this so that we can recharge this layer here. Um, and this is also a system that was used um, traditionally in India. So we find also solutions in looking back in time, solutions in heritage. The Indian tanks functions a bit like an upside down pyramid. Um, so during the monsoon, they collect the water. That leads then to a rise of the first aquifer. And then many people have private borewells, so they suck up this water. Um, so it gets stabilized, it gets more used, and by the end uh, of the cycle, just before the monsoon, ideally the temple tank is dry, it can be cleaned and desilted for the next cycle. So that this process works, we, we can prove, we actually get, got some data, which is like data coming out of uh, mountains of books that were kept uh, by locals, uh, which are monitoring wells. And we made those data into uh, a visualization of the water table. So this is pre-monsoon. You see here the water table below and then post-monsoon. So it's actually increasing. But the thing is, it could increase even more and it could increase all over the city, not only in specific places. 
So we made this diagram here to go into the next step. So how do we make this concrete? Where does it land? Where do we try out the solutions? And that's where it becomes a more systemic approach, where we say we use nature-based solutions to target flood prevention, drought prevention, sanitation, and an improved urban environment. And we then devised eight of those measures, which I more or less already mentioned, except maybe the bioswales, which is a kind of system that runs across uh, alongside roads that is also treating, but also channeling to have systems for solid waste in place and adaptive building typologies. And then we looked at different watersheds in the city of Chennai that uh, tackle different issues. So one is looking at, uh, for instance, heritage, that is the temple area. One is looking at housing, a social housing area. One is looking at industry with a big market. And one is looking at a large urban area with, with, with a canal. Um, so I'm just going to show you one a little bit more detail. So that is the historic site with, uh, with various temple tanks and how we actually implement then all these different solutions together so they become a comprehensive system that works with the different um, uh, measures uh, together. So you see here this tank from here, the groundwater level is recharged, it comes up here. We build here, we renaturalize the whole area around, around the Buckingham Canal, we have bioswales so that we really increase, so again coming back to the title, building capacity, so that we really increase the water capacity and the resilience uh, here with the whole system. So the cycle goes from collection, treatment, recharge to build up water assets, like you would build up economic assets to then be consumed and be treated again. Um, that is a little bit how it would look. You see here those bioswales, the constructed uh, wetlands. We also worked with um, street vendors to see how their role could change, how there could actually be a role for people to maintain the system and how there would need to be enough space for the street vendors to continue. And so how this system then starts to work uh, with the different seasons and how it actually starts to be a dynamic system. We then um, started to prepare an application for the Green Climate Funds, which is a little bit like the World Bank, but it's more recent. It's a much younger bank, so to say, where all the developed nations pay huge amounts of money. So also France, um, Netherlands, Germany, to enable developing nations to deal with climate change and to, um, to devise mitigation and adaptation projects, um, which normally, so that's interesting, normally this, these are very engineered and they're not happening within the city, although the city is really the place where we need to adapt to this future climate change. So here we devised uh, packages of work. We have uh, kind of preparation components and that is where the work of the urbanist and the architect comes in in preparation really make a good a plan and a design then we have the build and structural components and then we have operation and maintenance components and then we looked also what are the different as we are busy in public space it becomes extremely complex and in Rotterdam as well as in Chennai as well as in, in, in Brazil, um, public compartments usually are very kind of compartmented. Um, um, we, have, we have entities that usually don't work together, so an integrated project, and that's all what, what climate adaptation is about and new types of energy to integrate things with each other. So that demands a lot of working together and collaboration with different departments. Um, we also looked at integration of scale. So how do we go from the scale of Paris Agreement, which sets out the goals, um, to India's intended nationally determined contribution, to then how can that trickle down to very concrete, uh, very physical projects in, in the city on the small scale? And how can we also integrate the so-called Agenda 2030, which is the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So this is 17 goals that the United Nations, so all nations, have agreed 
to work on this and it goes from what you can see here it starts with poverty reduction um, equity um, sustainable local economies biodiversity health and sanitation but also participation and good governance so how can we include this in a new development and how can we include and make sure that we leave no one behind that it's gender, gender sensitive there is economic benefits because participation also means always economic participation in a project so how can we take these benefits into the project so within this whole water as level trajectory we really um, asked we're asked to put a lot of Mm, emphasis on what are the benefits of what we're doing how can we map this out how can we make it visible how can we also show the potential for replicability so when we start somewhere with a with a so-called pilot project or an urban pilot as we call it here how can we make sure actually you see that potential uh, to be implemented implemented in the 53 tanks in the city so for each um, project, each flagship project, um, so this is like these different watersheds that I showed you before, we looked at also an ownership and operation um, pro pro proposal, how this could uh, work economically. So this like, I guess goes too far now to go into, but all these aspects, when you think about a new system are very important to think about the process in all its aspect into the future, how it will roll out and what role the different stakeholders um, are playing. So this is, for instance, the housing area next to the river, where we again look at placing the different uh, tools that we developed in different urban contexts. So here, you might have seen it, there is a, a playground that acts as a tank. So when it rains really hard, that playground disappears and gradually becomes flooded, while we also add some refuge spaces on the top of the buildings. So when it gets flooded, people don't need to leave their entire uh, plot anymore. Um, next to all this process, what is uh, extremely important is the finance. So the flow of water is also a flow of money. Um, so again, uh, I, I guess this goes a little far, but it, it basically, it's, it's an anal analysis of data that shows the flow of water and that shows that how we treat water right now, it leads to a groundwater deficit. But if we actually treat it right there where it occurs, it can lead to a groundwater surplus. It actually creates then a more uh, resilient way and it leads to a lot of cost savings for the end user. Um, these operational, so this is a lot less operational cost and the operational costs usually are put on the user, um, as you can see here. And why is that? That is because nature basically does the job for free. So a lot of things that we need to run with a lot of electricity, when we use nature and we make space for it and we make time for it, we can really shrink that footprint that then also leads to a shrunken footprint in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the various sources. So that is an, also in water. So that is, it's not only directly in energy that we have a footprint, but also in water. Um, and, and then we looked at, we, we tried to pin down, can we actually um, pin down what are the benefits? What are the benefits for property, for businesses, for health, for people who don't get sick so often anymore? What are the water savings? Um, and this is quite important when you work on a very large scale because then we see the total benefits per year and they get sort of put against, um, against um, the investment costs and the operational costs that we have to come up with. Um, so here's that um, in principle make payback mechanism a little bit more in detail. So it functions in fact the same way as, um, as the solar panels that are now put on people's private roofs where people get a sort of payback mechanism and they can uh, pay off their initial investment. So here um, we have public investment from international financial institutions that as it were sort of rains on the city and that enables the city to build 
um, nature-based solutions in public property and we have local loans that enable private people to build nature-based solutions. And then we have this payback mechanism by which the increased water assets then enable the city to sell this water locally, more stable, more clean, um, and where a tax revenue can actually be put in place so that it uh, can eventually lead to a payback of the loan. And um, this is, um, for instance, interesting to notice that in the Netherlands, the whole drinking water system and the wastewater system is only subsidized, I think, by uh, three or six percent. So it almost runs um, um, even, um, but water should not be something that is commodified and that large um, um, businesses get a hand on because then we'll, in the future, we'll pay much more. So this is just to illustrate a little bit this very intense process where we had meetings in Chennai, but also in Singapore with international financial institutions. And we sort of, although we kind of started totally from the other end, but we start to understand how uh, people are thinking on that level and how we can therefore focus not only on how uh, it works or how it looks, but also what it does, what are the impacts. And uh, this is uh, working with communities, so working with, uh, within the communities, seeing the, what is for them important, seeing how a project like this can, for instance, help them to understand and to become part of the solution and even help them on other areas of life and how they themselves define their own vulnerabilities. So for instance, uh, we found that 60% define the vulnerability through water. And we found by a simple calculation that women in the social housing area, they spend each of them four hours per day to source water. So to pump it, bring it home because they don't have running water at home. And if each of them would be paid only $1 per hour, that would lead to um, $4 million per year, which is already, uh, which, which means that the cost to, um, to improve this social housing area would be amortized in, in two and a half years. Um, then we worked on a policy study for the World Bank. So these are different reports right now. It got a little bit delayed because of COVID-19, but we hope that in uh, 2020 we can start the school pilot um, to kick off this process where we actually continue the research, but then on site with feasibility project. Uh, so everything we do here, you see here this program idea running um, at the bottom so that all the projects, so the first part with the water is leveraged and now with the field rights, everything feeds back into the program and informs this program that can eventually lead to large scale change. Um, now, I don't know how I'm with time. Um, it's, then I just continue for maybe five, 10 minutes, yeah? Or less, you know, two minutes? Yes, if possible, five minutes. Five, five. five minutes, okay, five minutes. Thank so you. this is right now, we were asked to uh, come from water into the theme of energy for the Atelier Rotterdam, IABR Atelier Rotterdam, part of the International Architecture Biennial. Um, so this is actually just next to me. Uh, this is the part of the exhibition where we made the LEAP, the Local Energy Action Plan, which consists of uh, some panels that, um, that we conceptualized and um, applied, a local energy action plan. So how could you make energy, how you, how you could build capacity again to make that local and how uh, you could conceptualize the why the how and the uh, what, and how you can apply this in different case studies, and how you can actually build from initiatives that are already on the site, how we work together with the municipality of Rotterdam. So again, the same thing, how do we um, connect the Paris climate deal to the neighborhood in this case, a very concrete uh, scale of action. How can we communicate the urgency? How can we connect the personal scale to the global scale and the scale that is in between that becomes in fact the leverage 
to act. And that is the scale where we as architects and urbanists are busy and how we can actually also devise how we can how we can put boundaries so let's not think about 2050 but let's think about a time scale that is much closer by that is only 10 years so rather than uh, setting it out as you might know in new zealand now they have a time scale of five years because that means that it happens in the period which we can all foresee so this is a panel that shows the process and it shows the process between concrete actions and the overall capacity of the neighborhood. Then we made a panel on the tools, so how we can combine energy tools, climate adaptive tools, uh, together with governance. So actually this is about building commons, building uh, commons by collective action and shared assets. And the assets are built with energy and climate adaptation tools. So basically generating and managing energy locally and also cooling, and managing water locally. And what are the possibilities in terms of group processes that we have to manage these assets? To all of this, to in fact, as you want, like make the, the neighborhood into a battery, taking into account all the different owners and stakeholders that we have here when we make a cross section through a city, um, and how we can upscale this into the neighborhood. Um, then we looked at again what are the benefits. So we have here the natural assets and natural resources together with financial resources that come onto the neighborhood and how that can be quantified by actually saying we calculated now that 60% of CO2 footprint can be avoided, can be saved, um, and how that leads to a lot of qualitative benefits. Um, yeah, I'm just going to uh, show you very quickly those images. So that is one of those case studies, uh, 275 flats where we looked at the local energy system um, that stores heat in the ground, in the aquifer, in the ground uh, locally, um, and how we can use the climate adaptation um, tools locally. So build mini forests, build re recreative gardens, build food gardens, build water landscapes, and how we can manage this here with an energy hub where everything comes together and it actually becomes visible um, yeah so with various calculations basically to make sure there is a scientific part as well as a um, design part as well as a communicative part and what is interesting is that for instance modernist typologies are quite interesting to look at retrofitting with climate adaptation as well as energy uh, there's a lot of wind potential a lot of flat roofs a lot of green um, so the typology that is normally sort of the bad child uh, apparently lots of violence um, can have a big kind of um, entrance so now i'm just want to show a last slide. Yeah, so this is the kind of this process of where we can go from where we right now, where we all have this big black carbon cloud above our hands, to uh, gradually bring that down to improve um, and how we can make this step-by-step -step process, how we can devise that. So socially, energetically, and a greenification of the neighborhood. Um, so this I don't want to show much. Just want to end up with this sketch here um, that shows this leap that reminded me maybe of the Lecar, um, this sort of gap of of where we are right now from the neighborhood where we are right now to where we uh, need to be in the future, uh, and how we how that how that future needs to be carried by people, uh, by the inhabitants. So when we talk about this, also we need to renegotiate that role and understanding we have of governance and governments and how uh, not everything can be placed in other people's uh, responsibilities, but it's also sort of down to us how we devise uh, this local capacity. So um, thank you very much. I hope it was not... Uh, too long. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Eva. Um, thank you, Eva. I'll, I'll 
try not to take too much time, just ask maybe two very quick questions. Um, maybe one about planning and one about drawing. Um, the first one about planning, you, you work in, um, although I think both of you are not uh, non-Dutch, um, you work in the Netherlands, which is a very, let's say, one of the few um, planifying countries like France, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in which mm -hmm. kind of top-down thinking is, has a lot of history um, and a lot of force. Um, mm -hmm. and, and in your work, there is a lot of, let's say, the other way around, what you call a closed local loops and this kind of scaling up, the idea of scaling up things. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask you, which is, of course, extremely interesting, these kind of crazy small machines that can become something bigger. Um, my question is, do you think, do you believe planning is no longer relevant, let's say, on a larger scale? Mm -hmm. Do you think... Um, let's say the, the kind of small scale machines are just a step in order to grow up to something bigger or should we just now um, think more locally? And the second question, if, if okay, to connect them, uh, okay. is about drawings. Um, you showed a lot of drawings, but I think no plans, no sections, huh? um, mm -hmm. mainly kind of process drawings. Uh, mm -hmm. Some look a little bit like the, the French engineer, uh, Charles Joseph Minard uh, thing, mm -hmm. huh? uh, mm -hmm. which was more kind of measuring uh, numbers of trains or tons of mm -hmm. carbon or uh, uh, let's say uh, migrations. And so mm -hmm. it's a lot about flow and process. Mm -hmm. but I just wanted to ask you if for you, the question of drawing now, uh, let's say uh, in the architectural field should also somehow evolve um, in this kind of more uh, process oriented, less than kind of static reality mm -hmm. uh, oriented. And maybe a little bit about this connection with Minar, if there is something, because it's true that it's a very kind of a pont and chaussée pont engineer, uh, which was a very kind of planification uh, figure of mm -hmm. kind of top-down uh, machinery. And I, I, I think it's very interesting how you use it the kind of other way around from the small component to the system uh, as a whole. I, I hope it's too complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, you know, very, very relevant. So, so to start with the planning question, actually, I think the Netherlands is is very much into planning, but maybe traditionally a lot less top down than it might appear. Um, as the Netherlands had to fight against the water, and as this fight is something that only makes sense if everybody participates, there is this culture of consensus here in the Netherlands. And so that means that you sit around the table not until you found a compromise, but until you found a consensus. And um, so this is also how planning is uh, approached. Um, so that, uh, of course, there's also this lens that of course there's large pumping stations that keep the country dry but there's also starting another um, comprehension that that starts to to happen now that that is also that this idea that it needs to be many many small things that make the change but however this is still let's say somebody has to or some plan has to give a direction so we think that direction, and that's where the process comes in and the visualization of the process, that actually when you're busy with many small things, this process sort of becomes even more important because you don't work towards a spatial uh, big kind of master plan setup, but you work in a system. And in this system, you have many small parts which can change, but eventually they should perform together. And so um, I guess that's what we learned from the small scale projects, that there's always a performance, uh, that performance might turn out differently. So for instance, in, in Enscher Kunst, we learned that we actually could generate less water than we thought. So we had to shrink this garden. So this is about balance and capacity. And that's where, let's say, if you um, plan more the process and the process as a framework, but also the architectural and the urban work as a framework, then you can allow people to come in and, and change that or become part of that process without sort of destroying, if you want, the design of it. So there's an opening and for that um, understanding is very important. Now, unfortunately, I don't know me now. I'm going to look it up. Um, but what is we looked at, for instance, for the large project 
at these cutaway drawings from engineers of um, um, tube uh, metro maps and stuff like this, because there's always this aspect of understanding what you're doing. And we see here now that in the exhibition, actually these drawings that was also for Aqua Carioca, it's quite easy for non-architects to understand these drawings. And maybe that's why we now we have plans <laughs> and um, sections, but we usually don't show them because for non-architects, which are more and more people we show to, um, these are less relevant or le more simply more complex uh, to understand. To uh, so so this is kind of how and also people when they if it's if it's a government everybody tries to see themselves in this new kind of dynamic where we all know until 2050 latest we have to get out of carbon so we have to decarbonize our whole way of life and that becomes then the performance goal uh, to work towards and to assess basically so this is why we try to visualize it's really a communication necessity we, we, we felt and we still feel. Thank you. I, I think we have one minute left. Huh? Uh, if there is a student uh, that just want to ask something, I can uh, either repeat it or ask it yourself. I think if we have only one minute. I would like to say I'm super admirative of your work and uh, it's uh, su super great and uh, I'm a big fan. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Eva. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, and I also want to, take the stu to thank the students that are uh, in a lockdown for some months now and that uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to um, organize this. Um, Lecture thank side. you. Huh? Thank you, Eva. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, Eva. you for coming. Thank you for listening, everybody. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Some points. Bye. Thank you. And thank you, thank you. for uh, the super uh, intervenant uh, that you uh, invited to discuss. <laughs> because this is the last one. Huh? Yes, the last one. Well, see you uh, in another occasion. Yes. Bye bye and good luck with IABR. Thank you. <laughs> there will be an exhibition actually in March. So if by any chance the vaccine pans yeah, out, yeah, yeah. you can travel. Maybe you guys can come. Yes, sure. <laughs> okay, bye bye. bye.